looking at verse 13. If you want to stand one more time, if you're able to, out of reverence of God's word, I certainly welcome you to do that at this time. The Bible says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as indeed the rest of mankind do who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose from the dead, so also God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep through Jesus. For we say this to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who remain, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always, always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. The word tells us the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord shall stand forever. If you've been paying attention, I have felt by God to make sure that our church is intentional in three specific areas this year. We are to be a praying church. Everything we do begins with prayer. We go on the attack against the enemy with prayer. We love one another through the power of prayer, and we seek wisdom in God's will for the leading of our church and for our lives through prayer. But we are to be a purposeful church. That means we are determined, we are resolute, we are steadfast, we are driven and committed to seeing lost people saved and Christians discipled and believers sanctified whole. But we are also to be a prepared church. At any time, on any given day, Jesus could return and we need to be ready. Matthew chapter 24 verse 36 reminds us what about that day an hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. In 1 Corinthians 15, 52, the Bible says, In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. And it will happen all of a sudden. On December the 7th, 1941, in the words of President Franklin D. Roosevelt is a day that will live in infamy. On a warm Sunday morning, the Imperial Japanese Navy Air Service launched a surprise preemptive military strike against the naval base at Pearl Harbor in Honolulu, Hawaii. The attack led to the United States' formal entry into World War II on the very next day, and the attack crippled or destroyed nearly 20 American ships and more than 3,000 U.S. planes. Most importantly, more than 2,335 soldiers were killed, along with 68 civilians and 1,100 people were wounded. The United States seemingly never saw it coming because it happened all of a sudden. On a Tuesday morning, many of you remember where you were, September the 11th, 2001, a series of four coordinated attacks by the terrorist group Al-Qaeda, was launched against the United States. American Airlines Flight Number 11 and United Airlines Flight Number 175 slammed into the World Trade Center in Manhattan. American Airlines Flight Number 77 destroyed a section of the Pentagon in Arlington County, Virginia. And United Airlines Flight 93 intended to target the White House, or the U.S. Capitol, but it was taken down by some heroic passengers aboard the flight near Shanksville, Pennsylvania. September the 11th, 2001, resulted in 2,996 people killed, with over 6,000 people injured, with an additional people dying from respiratory disease, even to this day. And there would be a resulting cost of over $10 billion dollars to infrastructure, to property damage in New York, Washington, and Pennsylvania. And the United States was seemingly caught off guard and by surprise because it happened all of a sudden. The first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ was announced 
by the angel Gabriel, not only to his parents, but to shepherds keeping watch over their flock by night. His first coming was announced, but his second coming will be all of a sudden. When he came the first time, he was born in a manger, but when he comes the second time, he will sit on the throne. When he came the first time, Pilate judged him, but when he comes again, he will judge all men. When he came the first time, he arrived in the humblest of conditions, a baby dependent upon the help and guidance of his parents. But when he comes again, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ into the world was a time of amazing grace, a time of wonderful miracles, a time of the outpouring of God's love and care for his children. Thank God for everything that Jesus accomplished when he came to earth the first time. But in Acts chapter 1, the Bible says he went away to heaven and he's coming back for his church. But while we wait, we have a responsibility to preach the gospel. Brothers and sisters, before he ascended back to heaven, he gave us some distinct promises that would change everything. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, he said, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. And in John 14, verses 2 to 3, uh, to 6, when they were despondent about him leaving them, Jesus told his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go now to prepare a place for you. And if I go, that means since I'm going, I will prepare a place for you. And I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, you may also be. And where I go, you know, you know the way. And Thomas said to him, Lord, we, we don't know where you're going. How in the world can we know the way? And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Regardless of what the world says, regardless of what unbelievers want you to believe this morning, the Lord Jesus is coming back. Our passage this morning from 1 Thessalonians, shares with us some events that will take place when Jesus comes back for his people. And these events give us hope. These events cause us to rejoice. In fact, Jesus said we ought to encourage one another with this news, to compel us to be ready for that day, because it will happen all of a sudden. The Bible says through the Apostle Paul that when Jesus comes again, it will be all of a sudden, and there will be, brothers and sisters, according to the Scripture, a resurrection. The Thessalonians uh, Nikans knew that Jesus was coming back, and, but they were confused about the doctrine of the second coming. They thought that believers had to be alive at the coming of the Lord Jesus, or somehow they would miss the resurrection. They also believed that their departed loved ones would be gone forever, that they had died and that was just the end of them. But Paul writes to them to set the record straight and to get us to understand that because of Christ's resurrection, we are promised our own resurrection. And because Christ rose from the grave, we too will one day rise from the grave. And if we are still alive when he comes, because it could be tonight, we will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. Paul said, I would not have you to be ignorant or unaware concerning those which are asleep. Paul's trying to say, we do not wish for you to be uninformed because if you are uninformed, you are easily influenced. You're easily misled. And if you are misled, the question then becomes, who are you then misleading? That's why you need to know the word for yourself. In the beginning was the word, and the word was God. The word was with God, the word was God. He was in the beginning. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of one begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. 
you need to know the word and you need to know the word of God. For the word of God is living and it is active, sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. The more informed we are, the less likely we'll be misled. Paul says, I would not have you to be ignorant. I would not have you uninformed. Let me fill you in on some very important information that you're lacking specifically about those who are asleep or those who are dead. For the believer, death is simply falling asleep. And only Christ can wake us back up. The word cemetery means sleeping place. And when you go to bury somebody who loves God and lay them in the ground, you are laying them in a sleeping place. They're not really dead. They are sleeping. Our physical bodies go to decay, but our spirit goes to be with the Lord. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, For we know that if our earthly tent which is our house, is torn down. We have a building from God, a house not made with human hands, eternal in the heavens. Paul said, I would not have you to be ignorant concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not like those who have no hope. And verse 14 tells us that God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep through Jesus Christ. And friends, because of Christ, I do not fear Death. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I know where I am going this morning. And I also know who is coming again for me. And the thought of sleep, the thought of rest in the presence of my Lord forever actually brings me some comfort this morning. Jesus was away at Bethany in Judea. You remember the story. And Mary and Martha had sent word to him that the one that he loved, Lazarus, was sick and he was dying. After waiting for two more days, he told his disciples, well, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. But now I'm going to go and wake him up. Jesus meant, of course, that Lazarus had died, but they thought he had simply fallen asleep. In fact, they said, Lord, isn't it good news that our friend is asleep? Because if he sleeps and rests, he might get better and over his sickness. Jesus said, then plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I'm glad I wasn't there, because now when we go, you will really believe, come and see what I do. When he finally got there, Lazarus had been in the grave for four days. And Martha said, Lord, if you had just been here, my brother, your friend, would not have died. And Jesus said, your brother will rise again. You're going to see him again. And Martha said, I know. I know I'm going to see him again when everybody else arises at the resurrection on that last day. And Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. Martha, do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she said to him. I have always believed that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who has come into the world from God. And I want you to see what happens here when he goes to Lazarus' grave. In John eleven thirty nine. 39, Jesus gives the command. He says, roll that stone away. And in Verse 41, Jesus shouts, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus, come forth. And friends, he called Lazarus by name. He went to the grave. He went to the sleeping place. And he did not just say, come forth. Because he, if he had just said, come forth, Adam's waking up. I got a witness here this morning. Moses is waking up. Noah's getting out of the grave. Daniel's coming out. Zechariah, Joel, Amos, Mark, Matthew, Peter's coming out. My grandpa and grandma are coming out. So he said, Lazarus, I'm talking to you. Come forth. 
In church, I'm listening for my name to be called. I'm waiting for him to say, Marshall, it's time. Because I'm waiting on the Lord this morning. Sometimes we sing, I have a maker. He formed my heart. And before even time began, my life was in his hands. I wish I had a singer here this morning. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He sees each tear that falls. And he hears me when I call. I've heard it said that when Christians die, their name is called. But when the unsaved die, their number's up. I'll be listening. Not for my number. But I'm listening for the Lord to speak my name. Because Christian hope is not wishful thinking. It is confident expectation. Because we do not grieve in the manner of the hopeless, the way they grieve, but we rejoice that death for the believer is an open door that leads into everlasting life. For the unbeliever, death is terrifying, it's unknown, but for us who know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we are waiting for the day when the Lord himself shall call us and come get us for himself. There will be a resurrection on that day. But there will also be a rescue. Paul says we will be caught up and that it will be happen all of a sudden. Scripture says that two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other one left. Two women will be grinding at the handmill. One will be taken and the other one left. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know what day or hour your Lord will come. We will be taken from this world and brought instantly into another world. It will happen in a blink of an eye that one minute we're leading a normal life right here on earth and the next minute we're in the presence of God. One second I'm just washing dishes at the sink and the next second I'm looking into the eyes of the living God. One second I'm just watching TV in the living room and the next instant I'm in heaven with the Lord. Church of the living God, bride of Christ, you got to be ready because you do not know the hour when the suddenness of his rescue will occur. But he is coming again very soon. And the sad part of all this is that when Jesus comes again, not everybody is going to be ready. He's coming back for his family He's coming back for his church. How can I be sure that I am ready? How can I be sure that when he comes, he will take me with him to be where he is? How can I be sure that I go to heaven? It's very simple. It's right here in Acts 16, 31. Paul and Silas gave the answer. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Notice they didn't say believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because I read in the Bible that even the demons believe in Jesus Christ and they shudder. But he says, believe on. That means I'm putting my trust, my hope, and my faith on the fact that Jesus is who he says he is. I am basing my whole existence, my past, my present, and my everlasting future on the knowledge of the basis that Jesus is the Son of God. He is the Messiah, that he did die for my sins. He was buried. He was in a tomb for three days. But on that third day, one Sunday morning, that tomb ripped apart. The grave exploded. Jesus was raised from the dead. Let me leave you with one more point. And if you've not shouted yet, this is a good place for an amen. Amen. (laughs) The rescue by the Lord is going to be so incredible that the very language of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 rings with excitement and expectation. Listen to the text. The Bible says in verse 16, for the Lord himself, I could probably preach that for a while. The Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Did you know that scholars tell us that there are seven archangels that attend the throne of God 
all day, every day. Only two of them are named. You know what they're named? Gabriel and Michael. Gabriel is the announcing angel. Whenever God wants to announce or proclaim a message, he chose Gabriel. In fact, when God was ready to announce the birth of Christ, he sent Gabriel to break the news. But when Michael shows up, somebody is getting a beating. Because Michael is a warrior. He's a fighter. He is a soldier in the, in the army of God. So here's a shout. Are you ready? When Christ comes again, he's not going to be sending Gabriel. And he's not going to be sending Michael. The Bible says he's coming again himself in all of his glory. And to really understand the significance of this event, you need to know a little bit about a Jewish wedding. A Jewish wedding included a betrothal, which means that the bride was selected for the groom. And it was the father who chose the bride for the groom for his son, right? And then once that arrangement was made, there was a period between the betrothal and the marriage. And in that betrothal period, which was often about a year, the groom would go away and he would get everything ready for the bride. He went away making sure that everything would be ready for his bride right on time. So the groom would purchase some land and he would buy a house and he would decorate everything and make sure everything was taken care of for his bride. He went away and prepared everything for his bride. And then, when it was announced that the groom was coming, the bridesmaids would fill their lamps with oil because they did not know when the bridegroom would arrive, only that he was coming soon. And it was their responsibility as bridesmaids to make sure that the way was lit with these lamps full of oil. One day, the bridegroom is coming. God has already selected a bride for his son, and his bride is the church. And one day, the bridegroom is coming back. And in the meantime, he's gone to prepare a place for his bride. And now, it's our responsibility to make sure that there is oil in our lamps because we don't know when the bridegroom will arrive. So I have to keep my lamp full of oil. And Paul, of course, is talking about the Holy Spirit of God who keeps us accountable and keeps us connected and keeps us ready. The Holy Spirit reminds us to ask every day this question, could today be the day? Could today be the day when the Lord returns? If it's so, I have to make sure that I am ready. And I am thankful that there is not only coming a resurrection and a rescue, but there will also be a family reunion. They were confused about who had died in the faith, and they didn't know what would happen to believers after death. And so Paul got their hope straightened out for them, that we will not prevent those who are asleep. I mean, can you imagine that one of these days the graves are going to open up and people who have died are going to wake up and their bodies are going to be reconstituted and restored with their spirit. No matter if they drowned, no matter if they were cremated, no matter if their body was never found, no matter if they perished during some war throughout history, God knows where everybody is. And God knows where every part of every person is, every particle, every chromosome is going to come back together. If they love God, they will meet him in the air. Brothers and sisters, the dead are going to rise first in Christ. And then we who are alive, if we are still here and remain, we will be changed. Paul said in 1 Corinthians, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and they will be risen imperishable, and then we shall all be changed. A mystery is not that which we can know nothing, it is that which we can't know everything. 
And there are some things that God chooses to reveal to us, but there are also some things that he has kept secret for himself. He has told us in his word that there will be a resurrection. He says we ought to be looking for him. We ought to be living for him. We ought to be loving him and our neighbor as ourself enough to lead them to the knowledge of the saving power of Jesus Christ. And one day, we're going to upgrade and we're going to trade mortality for immortality. This corruptible body is going to put on incorruption. We will trade brokenness and frailty for perfection and holiness. And if you're like me, there are some empty seats around my Thanksgiving table. And there's empty seats around my Christmas table. For some of you, there's one less stocking to hang on the fireplace at Christmas time. There's a couple of faces missing from your family reunions. But church, I came to tell you that one of these days, if we finish the good fight of faith, if we persevere until the end, if we have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, we will see our loved ones again. There will be a family reunion. The great day when God says, Son, go get them. And Gabriel will sound the horn. It will happen in the blink of an eye. It will happen all of a sudden. And Jesus himself will come to get us so that we may be where he also is. And friend, over there, there are no more goodbyes. Over there, there are no more tears. Over there, there's no doctor's appointments. Over there, there's no hospitals. There's no nursing homes. Throw down your canes. Throw down your walkers. Take out your contacts. Pull off your glasses. Put on your dancing shoes. Oh, can you just picture it? One day soon over there, it will be peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. Oh, what a day, glorious day that will be. Stand to your feet. Let's sing together before we go.
my Jesus I shall see when I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by his hand and leads me through the promised land what a day glorious day that will be and man thank you jesus thank you for this day thank you for this message lord we all have a decision to make and lord i just pray that we all decide on you so lord i just pray that you go with us today help us to keep serving you serving others loving others and as we go through the day, Lord, just help us to keep this message in mind. We're so grateful for your love, for your sacrifice, and your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. You guys are dismissed.